Let's record. <laughs> yeah, there we go. This it's right. it says it's being recorded. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, all right. What have we had so far? We're talking about what is a healthy psyche, mm -hmm. and we've got the first model was the sage who tries to order her mind in a way where she reflects the universe. Okay. And so this is both spiritual and natural. There's no gap between the spiritual and the natural. So the this, this spiritual means living for the sake of something <coughs> greater than yourself, all right? So the corrupt is living for the sake of pleasure, wealth, power, or personal glory, all the things that you can measure that, you know, people in this world respect, that's corruption, but that's unnatural. It doesn't make people happy. Internally, people are conflicted and then they create conflicts with each other and they depend on each other and they, they don't trust each other. So societies fall apart, everything falls apart. So it's not natural, it's self-destructive to pursue irrational goals. By nature, we pursue justice or living for the sake of the well-being of our children, of our society, uh, creating laws, and also getting along with other countries and also integrating with the natural world. The, so the sage, tries to keep all of this in perspective and is always living for the sake of something greater. And that's natural. That's the only way you can flourish as a human being, okay? That was the first model. The second model, and it, you can, here's where we're going. You could pit it completely against the first model or you can completely integrate it with the first model or somewhere in between, okay? Each of you is going to come to a different conclusion and hopefully your conclusion in this class is not gonna be a permanent fixation. You'll change your mind, you'll readjust based on your knowledge, your experience, what's going on in your society, all this stuff. So whatever else I think, I think that thinking about the serious questions is a creative activity. It's a dynamic activity and you're always doing it. You should always be rethinking things. That was definitely the model of the ancients, but I think it's actually what people do and when they stop doing that, societies get worse and people get worse because they get fixated on something. Okay, Ivy. Um, Ivy, we are going to meet Monday, Wednesday, and Friday because we cannot seem to all get here for 75 minutes twice a week. So we're going to meet on Fridays. And then the posts are going to be due at 3 p.m. on Saturdays, okay? All right, so that was the, the pagan, the natural, spiritual naturalism, all right? This week we're doing, the model starts with a different model of human nature, the human condition, the origin story. So, on this model, there is a personal God who actually intervenes in history. On the model of the sage, God does not intervene in human affairs, all right? Human beings match themselves to live according to the order that is what God is. God is that order. Okay, on this view, there's a personal God and God, God's servant was Abraham, who lived in Israel. And God has a special plan for Abraham and the sons of Abraham, 
or the people who convert or accept belonging to one of those traditions, which is Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. So if you accept that, you're special in the eyes of God and you're part of God's plan, okay? Now, human beings on this view are primarily their free will, right? Their free will is the ultimate determinant of their primary goal in life, which is salvation after death. So you're born into a world that is temporal, but you have innate ideas about the eternal and you have the capacity for math. Math is about eternal truths. So you're supposed to look, look at the natural world, at the human world, at your own psyche in terms of those eternal truths that you, if you freely choose to live by the eternal, you'll get saved. And if you turn your will toward the temporal and you choose pleasure, power, wealth, and glory, you'll be damned, okay? So the goal of life is to use your free will in a way that you will be saved after death, right? This whole life is an, you know, in between birth and salvation or damnation. Okay. Now, you were given a guidebook for this, right? You're given two guidebooks, actually, because this God created the universe and it's ordered and we can know it. So the guide for how to use our free will is partly reason, but we also have scriptures, right? Scriptures is God communicating with individuals and this long history of that. Um, Jews and then God made himself a human into a human being, that's Jesus. And then the Muslims believe that Jesus died too soon so that uh, people were not able to, most people get married, they have kids, they get jobs, they work in business, they work in politics. There was no guidance for that. Jesus died too soon. So God sent Gabriel to speak to Muhammad and Muhammad is the seal of the prophets because he gives a model of how to realize God's plan while you're married, you have kids, he was a businessman, he was a political leader. So that's the story, okay? And that this somehow, these people who are involved in this history are special in the eyes of a personal God, okay? So that leaves out Hindus, Buddhists, Confucians, uh, atheists, agnostics, humanists. They're not in the loop, all right? All right. So now last time, um, well, let me start then with um, your first reactions or this, the thing you wanted to come to class saying, right? The comment you wanted to make. And then I'll go back to what we've done in class. So Alicia, what did you want to say? <laughs> I have to be much more diplomatic in the way I say what my thoughts really were when I first had them. Um, I started out with the, the, the New York Times articles and uh, I don't want to make fun of the mother. I don't want to like make light of her situation. I don't, but to me, it just seems like she has it all backwards. You know, it's not, Okay, religion and faith are two different things to me. Religion is the way that a person practices their faith. It's the things that they do. It's the rituals that they perform to kind of bring themselves closer to what they hold sacred. Okay, so I would not ever blame religion for 
being afraid of sin and, and punishment and things like that. But I see, I mean, I would not ever blame faith for that. And religion, since it is carried out by people, is, you know, it's imperfect. It gets misused and mistreated and misinterpreted and ends up in people's minds the way it's ended up in this woman's mind. And so her children are not going to be raised with that as an option because she's not, she's not introducing it into their lives at all. And I, I don't think faith should be forced on anybody, but I also don't think that it should be completely removed from somebody's purview either. I mean, and the second article wasn't as bad because you could see some people who were willing to kind of acknowledge that fact that, I mean, while religion itself doesn't lead to trauma, the way people express themselves through their religion is what is causing the trauma. It's the hypocrisy that's found in a lot of different practices. But I mean, that's one of my, I can get on that box for a lot of different reasons. That's good because, yeah. okay, I mean, so you have a lot of experience, right? Yeah. And that's why I was saying that theology or your worldview should be a constant creative experience, right, yeah. Alicia? And so I would imagine in the past, you've had a lot of experiences that have led you to rethink stuff, right? Yeah, well, that's good. And that that's like my main thing. So you remember on Seneca, we had, I gave you the best description and then we had the Reddit about yeah. how stoicism is used to justify misogyny, right? I couldn't believe they wanted to just get rid of the classics. I was like, yeah, but then use them, you know, they're being used to justify sexual assault and right. all that stuff. Right. right. So this is the same theme. Does that make sense? Yeah. That here, we, I, Augustine's doctrine over here, here's how it actually gets lived out. Yeah. Good. That's good. Um, and I do think that's an advantage of having some non traditional older students and some 20 year olds. Does that make sense to, to you all? <laughs> that there's advantages to having people of different ages taking a class. Um, I used to teach night school and that's how it was, or weekend school, so. Um, uh, Ivy, what did you come with that you wanted to talk about? Can I go next? I'm still trying to collect my... Um... Okay, Warren, go ahead. Perfect. Um start off with um with what alicia was saying i was saying to her what i was about to say was that the lady because i didn't want to interrupt her the lady why don't you had, come uh, a little closer to the microphone maybe i'm old and i'm my hearing can is you hear me old. now i guess so it's, it's a little jarbled i don't know what maybe it's his maybe it's the computer or something why don't you just sit close to your computer so that can you hear me better? Yeah, that's better. Okay, it, it probably was the, the earphone. Mm, okay. That I had. Okay, yes, because I didn't want to interrupt her to, to steal her chain of thought, but um, from reading the Raising Children Without Concept of, concept of Sin, I kind of get where the mother is coming from because as psychology majors, they teach us about nature versus nurture. And being a child and your parents instilling something in you from a very tender age until you were a teen, it's going to be hard to break away from that. And she even says it in the, in the post to say, um, breaking away from something that you were taught ever since you were a kid is very hard. And she's having issues with um, teaching her children with what um, is going on to the point where she says, okay, her main focus is 
what you do now and how you interact with people, basically. She's not basically focusing on sin or what sin is to her kids. She's basically teaching them morals, like how you teach people equality and all that type of stuff. And I think she had to figure it out on her own as opposed to someone teaching her exactly the right way, I would say, because really we can't look at someone and say, oh, you're doing this the wrong way. It's their personal views and we have to respect that. We have to tolerate it. So with her, I think she's just still battling with the way of finding what is the right ground. And I think the reason why she moved the way to such a general thing to say, just treat people right, is that as soon as you get into specifics, that's where it gets complicated to say, oh, you should not do this. You should not wear this. You should not say this type of stuff. That's more specific stuff. So she just kind of went out into the world after she got sent to the Christian school because her parents caught her fornicating, she said, with her boyfriend at the time. They sent her away to a Christian school. She just stuck to finding a moral foundation to say, okay, all people are equal. Basically, don't be racist. Treat everyone right, whether they're gay, straight, whatever they are. Still um, understand that they are people in um, everyone's eyes and not to be basically mean individuals. That's what she's teaching her kids, as opposed to when she was a child. She was basically locked in a box, I would say. Um, she was not allowed to say um, words such as gosh or darn or geez, she said. And even, even if they picked up, even if her parents had the slightest idea that she was thinking about something that was not straight along the lines that they were thinking, she would still be criticized or scolded or whatever, whatever. But I think she's still trying to find a common ground herself because she, she's out there on her own and she's not trying to confuse her children and be like, oh, you have to stick to this because as soon as you start teaching kids specifics, that's when they're gonna be like, oh, my mom said this, my mom said that. And you being a child, you're gonna respect your parents. And you're basically gonna go out into the world and be like, okay, you're a product of your parent. And they don't want it. She doesn't want her children to go through the same things that she did. Basically, that's for the first article. For the second one that I read about, um, that had to do with more of a psychology Based, um, that says uh, religion leads to trauma. Um, what I have, have to say about that one is the past class that we've had, with, um, that we've had with philosophy with you, Dr. Beck, um, since the semester started, I think one of our main subjects or topics has been free will. And reading this, it is basically telling us that people are completely going against what God wanted for us in terms of free will, because how are you going to tell me that, okay, I'm a part of your church, but you can't watch TV. You can't wear this and you can't wear jewelry. You're basically taking away from the free will that God intended for us to have. And when you're, and it all goes back to, um, the whole specifics when people go, go into specifics and be like oh you can't wear this and you're not supposed to do that and whatever whatever it's almost as if you're trapping them in a prison they're like free in a prison in a sense like don't do this don't do that and it kind of messes with their psyche in a sense that's why it causes trauma and it leads them to um in the article it says um people even have ptsd post-traumatic um, stress disorder syndrome that, that word and it's just that these religions that they're a part of that human beings are putting their twists to is what's really causing the trauma so it's not that oh if you're a christian you're going to have a traumatic experience it's the twist that people put on the christianity that is causing the trauma that's what alicia was saying right yes yes that is, that is exactly what, what, what she was saying. Okay, what? so you would say corruption in the name of Christianity, right? Yes. Yeah, like telling the child you're bad instead of telling them what you did is wrong, what you did is bad. 
because then they internalized that they themselves are bad. And so um, that seems like what happened to the lady in the first article when it's not her, you know, she exactly. wasn't bad. She made mistakes. Exactly. Everybody does. So, yeah, actually, but what about what Augustine decided when he stole the pears when he was 16? Right? Yeah. I, I, I have not really wrapped my head around. So, why do people rebel? Why? is there such a thing as a rebellious teenager? Are they really acting that way just because they can? Just because it's there to do? Because of the risk, the excitement of doing what other people say is wrong? Like, I don't... That's, that's a good question, but I got to give Ivy oh, you know, okay. a little bit of time here. <laughs> Go ahead, Ivy. So for the uh, first article, I just want to say... Um, I understood the mother's point of view because for me, it was, it's like um, when you grow up and they tell you this is what's good and what's bad, right? And um, I remember in this one philosophy class, they told, um, there was this one uh, philosopher and he said that religion is, was either you do this you know, you believe in this and you have a chance of salvation. And if you don't, then there's no help for you. And so I feel like um, people with that, people think, okay, I have to do this a certain way and I have to live a certain way in order to have a chance of salvation. Otherwise I'm doomed. I, it causes anxiety inside of a person to know what if this was the thing that, um, doomed me you know what if this was unforgivable and I feel like in a way that is how religion has a hold over people and um in the second one they were talking about how the one kid I think he was gay maybe I, I'm not really sure why he got sent um but he got sent to camp and they basically beat him to uh correct or Oh, no, it wasn't gay. It was because he couldn't memorize the scripture. Yeah, it was because he couldn't memorize the scripture and they like beat him until he could. And to this day, he like is still traumatized over that. And I feel like in a way it is how people interpret um, or how people choose to spread religion, but how the mother chose to not give it to the children, just teach them this is how you should live, not really put religion in it and give them a choice later on in life when they've found themselves. I feel like that's a good way to approach it, be, approach it because um, you said, why do people rebel? I feel like they rebel because they've been told all their lives, no, you can't do that. No, you can't. It's not right. You shouldn't. And so then they become on their own and they're like, no one's here for me. Why can't I? You know, it's my life. I should be able to do what I please. And so they go off and do all the things that they've been neglected. Um, and then let's see the second one. They were talking about weaponizing scripture. Again, that's um, one of the ways that people manipulate Christianity. A lot of times nowadays I see where churches are just out for greed kind of um it, it depends on a lot you have to think well what is the right church you know how do I know what is actually a good beneficial church healthy environment for me and what's just a religion because people need it you know and I feel like you Alicia is blessed to have come up in a um, household where religion is just a, you know something that you can go to for comfort oh, sorry my phone's died go to for comfort but like for other people it feels like a prison like as Warren was saying it feels like something that's just taking a hold of them and I feel like those people have to go off and find themselves and figure out what religion to them is it doesn't necessarily have to be um the bible or god but it just something for them to have faith in so again like with the first article the woman was um, talking about how her kids were activists and they um, 
stood up for people and they did all kinds of helpful things. And I feel like that is a way for them on earth to be at peace because that's really what religion brings us peace of mind to know that we are stable we are taking care you know we are doing the right thing with our lives and so to the people who feel like it's a prison it causes anxiety and they're like okay well if I die will I go to hell Whereas if you're just focused on your moral life and you're not worried about heaven or hell, you're like, okay, well, what can I do today that will bring me happiness? You know, if that makes sense. And then um, was, I think this one was from Augustine. They were talking about uh, free will. And I feel like he made a really good point. Free will is a test. It's what you choose to do with the, uh, I didn't really agree with a lot of things he was saying at first, but that overall free will is a test because if you uh, choose, you have these reasons, you have what your parents have told you, you have your life experiences, but it's what you choose to do with what you're, you're given. Do you choose to follow into your parents' footsteps and spread that, or do you choose to find your own truth? You know, um, yeah, that's what I have to say. <laughs> Okay, so I think that quickly. Okay. With the whole um why kids rebel and mistakes and all that type of stuff mm -hmm. and free will. Okay. A lot of people don't there's a difference between a choice and a mistake. People choose to rebel as opposed to making an honest mistake. And a lot of people abuse it to say, oh, it was a mistake, it was a mistake, it won't happen again. But they choose to do it as opposed to it being an honest mistake. And with the whole free will and why kids rebel, I can tell you from personal experience being around people and why kids quote unquote rebel or misbehave, I can tell you the kids that look forward to coming college, to coming to college the most are the ones that were in strict households where they could not do this and whatever they'd be like oh my mom is not going to be here to do this so I can do whatever I want now and those are the kids who not all the time end up in bad situations but oftentimes than not they end up in bad situations and they're the ones people label as rebellious kids but really they're just trying to see what they have been missing in a sense because they didn't have the necessary free will under their parents and well, it, it's emotionally repressed, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Not, not necessarily free. They don't know what's out there. So they are really just choosing to explore. And with that choice comes the mistakes. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, uh, it's not just an honest mistake to get, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Sometimes, get sometimes drunk and go end up in a room with a woman <laughs> yeah some people choose they know that it is wrong and they still do it so that's a choice uh, okay so that the thing about augustine and the pears is he said everyone by nature wants to do what's bad because it's bad knowing mm -hmm. it's bad now if that's true then you have to be Christian to be virtuous, which means if you're Confucian or Buddhist or Hindu or just a humanist, you're somehow, you're gonna go to hell, right? <laughs> because only Jesus gives salvation, right? And so you have to think about that, right? Do you agree with that or not? I'm not going to, Friday, we can talk about that if you want to, but um, what I want to just talk about for a minute is the intellectual part of that. So saying that Confucians and Buddhists and all that can't go to heaven is against reason, right? Your reason tells you that other people have reason, right? And so your reason would look for a common humanity and a common path to God. 
but your reason alone would never say I'm more virtuous than you because of what I believe without evidence. Your reason is always going to look at how do I behave, right? If somebody lives their life being just and merciful and loving the good, they're not going to go to hell according to reason, right? I mean, the truth is, you don't know. You don't even know if there is one. You don't know any of that stuff. But what does reason tell us and what has to be taken on faith? And um, uh, so, and Augustine wanted a combination of those. So even on Augustine's view, you could disagree about what you're supposed to think of people outside of the Christian tradition, right? But let me just um, talk about his view once more about wisdom. Okay, so... You're, you're looking at your psyche, your consciousness. You know you exist, you're alive, you understand things, right? You understand the universe and your reason is your highest human activity. Your senses judge things as pleasing or not. Uh, we know that we see, we judge, the, we judge our own sensations. And then we realize that we have this capacity for, for filtering through all of our sensations and finding that underlying order, right? So he starts out with math. At first, we don't see the connection as a kid between all this stuff in front of us and math, you know, taking math class, but eventually, um, we have, we look at our capacity for math. The numbers are eternal. They don't change. If there's anything above reason, it's got to be eternal and unchangeable. Each of us has our own mind. Each of us can see the same things in common. You could teach math to anybody all over the world, right? Not higher order math, but enough to understand number and that number doesn't change. Uh, we, we, uh, we understand the order of the truth of number. We all possess the concept of unity. It doesn't exist in the material world. Numbers depend on the concept of unity. They're a product of human reason. And then we understand the natural world through measure and number. So we understand it through our minds. We also have these inner rules, inner innate rules, innate ideas. Everyone thinks he's wise. Everyone wants to be happy and wise. These are stamped on our minds. Um, okay, wisdom is the truth in which the highest good is discerned. Um, wisdom is one, but even though like the truth is a unity, people are corrupted by the flesh, right? So they all have their own ideas of what will lead them to happiness. But these ideas in our head say that we ought to live justly. We ought to follow the golden rule. The inferior is subject to the superior, right? What's, in, what's superior by nature controls what's inferior. Everyone should be given what's appropriate, what they deserve. The uncorrupted is better than the corrupted and the eternal is better than the temporal. Those are all innate ideas, right? We don't get those ideas just by eating and drinking. <laughs> They're in here. Um, so then we take those ideas and we apply them to human action. We, the ideas drive us to reject corruption or to reject choosing pleasure, wealth, power, and glory. We make judgments about particulars according to these innate ideas. We don't judge the rules. We don't judge the golden rule. Well, I don't know if the golden rule is true. I mean, that's, 
I don't know if two plus two is four. No, there's certain, everyone should be given what they deserve. Um, just people ought to be treated justly. To be a just person is to treat other people justly. I mean, all this stuff we can agree on. Um, and then we don't know that sometimes our minds see the truth more clearly and other times not. So reason believe, leads us to a belief in something higher than our own minds, something eternal and immutable. Uh, reason uh, teaches us about the fallibility of our own application of those ideas. Um, so it leads us to believe in something higher than our minds, some eternal truth, and that is what God is. That is what God is, the God of reason, the God of eternal truth, right? That's what it would mean to say we're made in the image of God, okay? And so Augustine is not at all anti-intellectual, right? He's, he's very intellectual. Okay, and then this um, outline just, again, goes through all that. Truth in the natural world, truth in human judgment, truth and society and truth. Um, okay, so I did that last time also. If you want to page through that, I think the reasoning there. The next thing was the, um, the reading about free will, right? Augustine's ethics. So start out with some questions. Evodius, this is a really good book. And again, I guess, you know, I, I did write in this, the stream, I think that when I taught the women from Asia, I scanned all this stuff and broke all our copyright laws. And so if you don't, you know, if you haven't bought the books, um, I guess you can get away with not buying the books. And so I'm sorry if you have bought the books, you might've wasted your money, but um, anyway, so Evodius is the, is the one who's always asking the question, you know, is always doubting. He's the doubter. So based on what you've read, what would Augustine say to this question? Why did you create evil? What's Augustine's answer to that? Alicia? Well, he answers at first that there's two different types of evil. Oh, am I muted? No? No. Okay. Um, I don't know. I think that, and I may get my readings confused here, but I think that Augustine would say that God did not create evil. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> right. God created a universe that included a creature with free will. Right. Because that is a better universe. Because that universe also has justice in it and virtue. Because justice and virtue are using your free will to choose to be self-controlled, to choose to treat others well, to choose to make good laws. So a universe that has the capacity for those higher levels of being and truth and beauty um, is a better universe than one without that capacity. So a, a universe with a creature with free will is a better universe than a universe with a creature without free will. The trouble is that universe also has the potential for evil because it's not free will unless it has the potential for good and the potential for evil, right? And what is evil? So Warren, what is evil? evil <laughs> or ivy how does he define it oh well i mean i'll i'll go ahead because we have like 10 more minutes and then it's pretty obvious i think we need another class <laughs> And was he the uh, sorry, was he the one that said that um, evil was beyond 
God? I might be getting them confused. Okay. Um, evil is, well, why didn't you create free will so that humankind would never sin? Well, then it wouldn't be free will. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's so even God cannot, God can be all powerful, all merciful, but God cannot prevent people from choosing evil because then they wouldn't have free will. Do you understand that? To be all powerful does not mean when people use their free will to choose evil, that you have the power to stop it. That would mean that you eliminate free will and a universe with free will is better than one without. Do you understand that? That God allows you to abuse your free will because free will is a good from God. Does everybody understand that? Yes. Yeah. Did you that, um, free will is something that we can't live rightly without we can't live right really without but that's also the cause of sin right yes isn't that what augustine said yeah yes. does that make sense to you yes okay so like horses uh they eat right they sleep right you know other animals are very prudential in the sense they have common sense and they take care of themselves right but that's not virtue because it's not chosen. They just do it by instinct and imitation and habit. Does that make sense? Yes. So then what you could say is what teenagers do is that they become conscious of their agency, of their power of choice. But that doesn't mean they have to go and drinking and sexing and you know all that stuff. It just That's where free will comes in of decision, where they decide what they want to do. Right. Yeah, no. they haven't experienced that side of it, though. They don't. They haven't experienced drinking, so how do they know if they would really choose to drink or not drink unless they drink and learn yeah. that? Oh no, I don't choose to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess to me, I never did drink because I saw the negative effects mm -hmm. on other people. Yes, that's exactly what I was about to say. Mm -hmm. That um. Yeah. their personal experience from within their environment they could see yeah. what happened to maybe their friend or just a stranger they see that people mm -hmm. die from it they can they can't control what happens to their bodies they get abused all that type of stuff so yeah, i yeah i don't know why anybody does support the alcohol industry just i mean i i boycott for that reason the effect that other people the negative effect it has, like 7% of any population has a body chemistry oriented toward being an alcoholic. And those people affect at least three other people, right? Everybody affects at least three other people, right? Just like Marriage, kids, that's 28% of a population that is extremely negatively affected just right off the bat. And so that's why, like, why would I support this right there's no nutritional value to it so that that's my i have a political reason for being a teetotaler right it's not a religious reason but um yeah anyway so but that's why i like teaching college because you have to decide right that's when you especially small liberal arts residential colleges because the whole point of it is to pull you away from habit and custom and imitation and make you very conscious of your power of choice. And then you decide how you wanna use it. And you literally start creating your character based on what you start choosing with the consciousness of your power of choice, right? Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Um, okay. So why didn't you create free will so that we wouldn't sin? Well, then it wouldn't be free will. <laughs> why? I think, I think from seeing all these readings and, and just internalizing, I think the world would not be balanced without free will. Because if we did not, if we did not have free will, there would not be good or evil. It would all just be all good or all evil. And on the scale, say we have good on the left, evil on the right. If we're all evil, 
it tips the scale in the, on that's imbalanced. If it's all good, it's the same on the other side. So if we have good and evil, even though we have some people, even though good might outweigh evil or whatever, whatever, but at least there is something on both sides of the scale. Okay, so here's another question. So usually when I have a blackboard, I write down a bunch of universes and you have to pick which one you think is the most perfect universe. Um, but it's a, it's a trick question because one of them has, one of them doesn't have free will, right, at all. Another one has free will uh, at the time of Adam and Eve before the fall, right? One of them has um, free will after people have chosen Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, cannibalism, brutality, massacres, you know, and as well as choosing good, right? It has everything with all the choices people have made. And then according to Augustine, the moment when it was created is that's what makes it perfect. But some of my students think it's more perfect because people have chosen all this ugly, evil stuff because it makes you conscious of your choice. But Augustine, I think, would say is you're conscious of your choice in here and everybody could have used it for good and it wouldn't be, the universe would not be any different than the universe where people have chosen evil because in God's mind, it's perfect because there is the potential, there is free will, but God did not want anybody to choose evil and the universe is not better because they chose it. Does that make sense to all of you? Yeah. You might not agree, but I mean, I, I think he's a genius in terms of, you have to appreciate the intellect of this guy, right? Because he literally has created a doctrine that he pulled it out of nowhere. It's a creative activity and it all fits together. Uh, okay, now, incidentally, I, I don't personally agree with this, but I appreciate it. I like every time I teach anything, I'm totally in love with it because it's such genius to be able to think about all this stuff, I think. And I also think every one of you, I want to get you sucked in and just, ha, ah, yeah. <laughs> and then next week, it'll be something totally different. It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's my goal, you know, is to get you totally in love with every one of them. And then you go, oh my God, Dr. Beck, I don't agree with any of them totally. I was like, good, <laughs> because now you're starting to know yourself, right? <laughs> okay, so, um, why isn't the world more complete? Because we've used our free will in every possible way. Well, the reason is then that would there would be somehow something good about turning the will away from the eternal toward the temporal. And there's nothing good about it, right? So it doesn't make the world more complete. It's our consciousness of free will that makes us, that makes the world complete. Um, why did you create free will, even when you knew, God foreknew, that people would abuse it? Well, because the world is more perfect, because there is free will in that world. And there is also justice and righteousness. And at the end of the day, after you die, then you get your punishment, right? In this world, sometimes bad people are rewarded but not in the next world, right? Um, so that's his answer to that. How can you possibly say evil doesn't exist, right? Well, it doesn't exist in God's mind in terms of creating a perfect universe. And when people use free will and they know how they're supposed to use it, they have reason. They got the guidebook. They have scripture. They have all, you know, they have every reason, they have the ability to make the right choice. But when they don't, that's not on God. <laughs> it's not God's fault. Don't blame me for this. That's you. you. <laughs> and so that's a sense in which it doesn't exist. God never created it. God never wanted people to choose it. 
but God gave the consciousness that it's an option. Um, the fact that God can see into the future, this is another issue, right? Okay, so what about this? Augustine says, yeah, but you think God is all knowing, which means God knows how we're going to use it. Well, how is it that God doesn't got, come on, God had to have caused it if God knows. Just, do you remember, I guess I'm going to have to just tell you the punchline and we're, we'll have a lot more to talk about on Friday. We don't have any extra readings, but I do want you to write three more. I want you to do the same things. Three things you learned in class today, your takeaway from um, today's class. And then next time we'll have more conversation, three more things. I do want you to have three more things that you bring to class on Friday. So what we'll do is I've organized it for twice a week, but I think it's going to work really nicely to have that third day to just uh, process or apply it and get it more firmly in your head. Um, but the idea here is that human beings, we have knowledge of the future. Okay, so I know if I'm alive in five years, I will be older, right? I know even if I die in five years, if my children are alive, they'll be older. So we know certain things about the future. What we know are things that occur by natural necessity, right? So the things that are natural, that function by eternal law, we know about the future of the things caused by eternal law, by the natural order. But we don't know events that are caused by free will. So then we think that if God knows that, it must be caused by natural necessity, right? And, and Augustine's answer to that is that it's just an article of faith that God knows the future of what's chosen by free will. That doesn't make any sense to us because our reason cannot get a handle on it. But we know the God of reason, the God that created an ordered universe, we can understand that and understand aging, understand some of our pain is caused by natural vulnerability, some of it's caused by sin. We can know all that. We just can't know uh, what we or other human beings will actually choose in the future because that's free will. But God knows it. it's an article of faith that God would know that, and we don't. Um, so that's, that's um, for starters. And I'll let you go because I made a deal with maybe with the devil, but with my students <laughs> that I'll see you tomorrow. I mean, Friday. Okay, guys? I like giving I, I like everybody giving a long time to talk to. That's good. Why is it called Oh,